Hey everyone, thank you for joining us for this Revelation study. This is week two. We're excited about what uh, God is revealing to us uh, through this. So, so glad to have you with us. Much of this study, I want to make sure that you understand this, much of this study is derived from a pastor in Jupiter, Florida. Uh, with their permission, we are using some of their notes, so uh, we wanted to give them a shout out. But let's go ahead and get started on some of the things about Revelation. One in particular is that many of us, I know I've stated it, many of you I'm sure have stated it as well, that the Revelation study, or the Revelation, the book of Revelation is hard to understand. Well, we want to say that that's not necessarily the truth because if we will look at it the way the Holy Spirit, the way the Lord has, let, has laid it out, then we will be able to understand. And that's what he wants us to do. He wants us to understand. In fact, the very book name, Revelation means to reveal. So uh, if he was wanting to reveal something to us, then uh, of course he's going to name the book Revelation. But if he wanted to conceal something from us, maybe he would have named it uh, the book of Conciliation. And he wouldn't have done that. Also, uh, Revelation, the book of Revelation, is the only book of the Bible that tells us that if we read it, we will be blessed. You can look at it right there in Scripture. If we will read the book of Revelation, we will be blessed. So why would he tell us that we would be blessed if he's going to conceal the meaning of it? He's now not going to do that. That's verse 3. Yes, absolutely. We'll, we'll probably remind you of these things every week. Every week, yes. Uh, Revelation also, the book of Revelation also, is uh, the only book that has its own outline. And so I want to read, uh, if you want to turn with me in your Bible, please have your Bibles always handy because we're going to be looking at so much in those. But if you would, turn to Revelation 1, chapter 1. Verses, verse 19, I want to read that to you because we're going to show you that the book of Revelation has its own outline. And it says, write down what you have seen, both the things that are now happening and the things that will happen. So right there tells you what the outline is to the book of Revelation. Number one, the things that you've seen, the past. Number two, the things that are, the present. And the things that will come, number three, the future. So, it's, so right there, what he's telling John, write what you see. So John saw Jesus in his glorified state. We looked, we looked at this last week. Number two, write down what uh, what is. Basically, I'm writing to the churches, which applies to us, mm -hmm. and write what is to be, Absolutely. what is to come. Right, right. Also, another very interesting observation. Um, in the first three chapters of Revelation, we stated this last time, and we'll be stating it probably every time, that in the first three chapters of Revelation, the word church is mentioned over 20 times. The word church is mentioned over 20 times. But after Revelation 4.1, church is not mentioned again except in, at the very end as a reference. So I want to read uh, Revelation 4.1, Revelation verse, or chapter 4, verse 1. Let me find that, 4.1. And it says, Then as I looked, I saw a door standing open in heaven, and the same voice had I had heard before spoke to me like a trumpet blast. The voice said, come up here and I will show you what must happen after this. So right there is the, is the rapture of the church. Rapture means to come up. So that right there is the rapture of the church. After this, though, begins the tribulation. So turn one more time with me, if you will, to Revelation chapter 6. Verse 16, and it says, And they cried to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of the one who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. So after the church is raptured, tribulation begins. And we see that right here in Scripture. So grab your Bibles and your handouts, and let's go ahead and start this study, this second week study, which will be Revelation chapter 2 verses 1 through 7, and we're going to read that to begin with, and then Steve is going to help us, Pastor Steve, is going to break that down for us. So let's read that together. Revelation 2, 1 through 7, and it says, Write this letter to the angel of the church of Ephesus. So we're looking at the church of Ephesus today, the very first church. This is the message from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and the one who walks among the seven lampstands. I know all the things that you do. I have seen your hard work, your patient endurance. I know you don't tolerate evil people. You have examined the claims of those who say they are apostles, but are not, 
You have discovered that they are liars. You have patiently suffered for me without quitting. But I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. Look how far you have fallen. Turn back to me. Do the works you did at first. If you don't repent, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. But this is in your favor. You hate the evil deeds of the Nicolaitans, just as I do. Anyone who has an ear to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious, I will give fruit from the tree of life in paradise of God. Okay, so Jesus dictates. Now, Jesus doesn't write. John does the writing. It's not John's revelation. It is John dictating Jesus' revelation. Right. So uh, these, these seven churches are so very important. I know, I know we did a sermon series on these seven churches just a few months back, but uh, I want we cannot skip this part because it is so important. So first of all, uh, this is week, uh, week two. This is the church at Ephesus. So uh, uh, these are not prominent churches during the day. Uh, it's not the church at Antioch, it's not the church at Rome uh, or Jerusalem. It is literally, uh, except for Ephesus, we would have probably never even heard of these churches if Jesus hadn't have dictated this letter through John. So seven churches, seven letters. Now I want you to notice something. All four, le I mean all of these letters have four elements or four levels of application. We're going to look at that, but first, also every one of these churches Every single one of them have three aspects of, of, uh, of uh, approach or, or uh, 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 Jesus, what he speaks to. Three aspects why, of what he speaks to. Let me say this, and that's why he didn't address the prominent churches, per se, is because he had to address the churches that were relatable to what was needing to be said. So each one of these churches have something that we need to hear from them. So, so remember, he writes... Uh, he dictates seven letters, and in all seven letters he says something different. Now we're going to look at why he says something different. In all seven letters, he has four levels of application, and he has three aspects of, uh, of address. And those three aspects, one of them, the first one is the, is the condom, uh, uh, or commendation, not condemnation, commendation. So in other words, this is what you're doing right. right. So I commend you, this is what you're doing right. Number two, the thing that he addresses is, uh, the, th the second aspect is, uh, is criticism. This is what you're doing wrong. So he tells him, this is what you're doing right. This is what you're doing wrong. And the third is the exhortation. This is how you fix what you're doing right. right. And this is your overall grade uh, as a whole. So uh, what you're doing right, right, what you're doing wrong, and how you can fix what's wrong. So notice with me, in the blocked area, in your handout, there are seven churches, and there, each church has four level of application and three aspects of what he addresses. And we just looked at that, but here's the four level, four levels of application. He says, to the angel of the church. So basically, number one is to the local church. So of the day, he is speaking to the local church. Uh, as of today, he's speaking to the local church. Number two is hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. Not only am I speaking to the local church, I'm speaking to all churches. And I'm doing that today, just like I was then. So I'm speaking to local churches, I'm speaking to all churches. And number three, let him who has an ear, let him hear. So in other words, I'm speaking to the local church, I'm speaking to all churches, and I'm speaking to the person. I'm giving you a personal challenge. And then number four, he gives a prophetic message to everyone to everyone. So I'm speaking to you locally. I'm speaking to you universally. I'm speaking to you in a personal fashion. Uh, uh, you know, I'm speaking to you corporately, corporately, and now I'm speaking to you individually, and I'm also speaking to you in a prophetic fashion. So I want you to notice something with me. This is so, so, so important. Please don't, don't miss this part or, or it gets messed up from here on. Jesus is laying out with precision detailed, pinpoint precision, the next 2,000 years of church history from then, not from now, from then. So he's laying out 2,000 years of church history. So how he begins is with the church of Ephesus. 
how he ends is with the church we are in today. Mm -hmm. So I want you to notice something with me. He says, I am laying out, he didn't say, say this, but it, it parallels exactly what the church went through and was going to go through. And I want you to notice something with me. He addresses every single church differently. Right. He has something to say differently to every one of them. Mm -hmm. And if, if, if it was just a cookie cutter, copy and paste, he would have said something that was the same to all of them. Mm -hmm. So as we go through 2,000 years of church history, we're going to see how the church has progressed and how they faltered and, and, and how they match up perfectly with what Jesus is saying. So Paul writes about this. So let's make sure we, 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 we jump back before we jump forward. Paul writes about this 30-something years before Jesus ever dictates these letters through John. Right, and we can find that in Acts. Uh, that's listed on your outline, Acts 20, 26 through 32. Let's read that together. For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore take heed to yourselves and, ta and to all the flock among, uh, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to the shepherd, the church of God, which he, had, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know that for I know that this, after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you. And let's underline that. Come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also underline this. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse. And let me say it, tell you there. Perverse means something a little bit different there. It means to distort or misinterpret. So he says men will rise up to speak distorted or misinterpreted things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore watch and remember what for what for three years I have not did not cease to warn every one night and day with tears. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. So uh, Paul is writing this years before we ever even, uh, ever, ever, ever there's a, 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 a John on an island of Patmos. Right. So this is what Paul is saying. I am travailing. I have spent three years to tell you this. I have cried tears in your midst. Please listen to what I'm telling you. When I am not with you anymore, after I am gone, these things are going to happen. He says, these things are going to happen. And what is going to happen is people from outside and from inside are going to try to twist your doctrine, try to twist your doctrine to pull you away. This is what, this is what break, break this scripture down. This is what will happen. False teachers will come. They will cause destruction from the outside. They will cause destruction from the inside. They will distort and mislead people. And they will draw people away from Christ. And this is a warning. I'm telling you, I can't tell you enough over and over and over, Paul says. But please, be vigilant. Right. And then he goes on and reads uh, and, 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 and dictates. Or then he goes on and he records in, in Ephesians something else. Yes. And remember, this is him saying that, listen, I'm telling you these things. Pay attention to what I'm telling you. And if you don't, this is what's going to happen. As a result, we are no we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, but the trickery of men by craftiness and deceitful schemes. So now he's speaking to the church at Ephesus. This is Paul. Years before, he is speaking to the church at Ephesus, which Jesus is dictating through John to the church of Ephesus. And, uh, and he is saying, these are the things that's going to happen to you. And, uh, uh, and the word Ephesus means, now, every church has a meaning. The church of Ephesus means, you notice at the bottom, it means desirable. It means endearing. So what that means is the church was desirable to Jesus. And if you'll notice, the apostolic age down there is about 100 years. So we're looking at the first 100 years of church history. So this is the church get, being established, and he's speaking to Ephesus, and he's saying that, listen, it's going to be easier than you think for you to be, for you to be uh, uh, distracted, for you to be led away. And I'm going to tell you why that, that is so easy. Because Ephesus was very pagan. Very, very pagan. Ephesus was very grand. It, they had some of the most wondrous sites in the entire world at the time. 
they literally dredged. And I, I did a sermon on this about a year ago. I can't remember exactly, about a year ago. And I just, we could go back and view that at any time. It was so grand that they literally dredged the, the harbor or the bay to get the ships right up to the edge of the city. People would offload from the ships. It was a desirable port. And they would literally, their streets were lined with marble stones, colonnades on each side. The streets were huge and wide. Vendors and, and, and commerce set up. There, they had stadiums to sporting events that seated almost 30,000 people in the day. So this is very grand. It was very steeped in paganism. They even, this was normal practice for pagan Old Testament history was that they had temple prostitutes that would prostitute themselves. They thought this, this is what they were taught was a good thing. They would prostitute themselves, raise money, and give to the temple. So uh, we can't try that again, so it won't work. So uh, as we move along, as we move along, you know, now notice with me, Jesus, I want you to notice something. I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you the last one, Tina and I are. But I want you to notice something with me. Every church that Jesus addresses, all seven churches, he gives himself a different title. Now, once again, if he was saying the same thing, then why wouldn't he, why wouldn't he give himself the same title to seven churches? Every church he says something different to. Every church he has a, a different title for himself. So and he, he does that for a reason. Because for they a reason. Need, they to, need to hear what he, the title that he is giving. They need to pay attention to that. For the time, that for, for what they were experiencing at the time. Right. So notice with me uh, 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 his title that he gives to himself when he addresses the church at Ephesus in verse 1. I want you to notice what he says. He gives himself a title to an endearing or a, uh, a desirable church. Uh, verse uh, 2 verse 1 says, Write this letter to the angel of the church of Ephesus. This is the message from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven golden lampstands. So, on your fill in there, write this in. Jesus, his, the title he gives himself to the church at Ephesus, the endearing church, is I am among you. I am with you. I am in your midst, some versions say. I am with you. I, I have not abandoned you. I will not abandon you. Because here's the reason why. The first century church was, at, once again, a desirable thing. It, it was a desirable to the Lord. It was desirable. It, it was endearing. People were going to have to give their lives to serve the Lord. They, the first hundred years was uh, uh, very difficult. But the, the church was growing at an alarming rate. Now, I want you to notice something with me. Let's go back, and then we're going to go forward, then we're going to come back to here. Let's go back into chapter 1, verse 20, and this is what Jesus says. I am in the midst of the churches. I am among you. So he is reiterating to that first church. See, he's just said, I am in the midst of the churches. Now he said to the first church, I am with you. I'm, I'm among you. In other words, you're going to give your lives. Most of you are. You're going to be martyred for what you believe, but I am among you, and I'm giving you strength that you have never known. So notice what he says, though. I want you to notice how he addresses the very last church. I want you, I want you to notice with me in chapter 3, verse 14. Now, the reason we want to reiterate this and to bring it to your attention is it's where we are now. This is the church where we are now. So you notice he addresses the very first church and says, I'm with you because basically it, you're, going to be, you're, going to, you're going to be martyred for your beliefs. Now look what he says. Uh, this is uh, chapter three. 3, verse 14. It says, write this letter to the angel of the church of Laodicea. Laodicea. This is the message from the one who is the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of of create God, new creation, God's new creation. Okay, he introduces himself, gives himself a title to the last church. Now, we're going to get there. We're just not there yet. I just want to show you something. He introduces himself to the last church as the first in creation. Now, let's not confuse this. This is not Jesus saying he was created because he's God. He, he right. is the creator. He's not created. This is him saying, I am first in creation, which means I am the creator. So, he is saying into that last day's church what we need to hear. He is introducing himself, and here's his title, I am the creator, because 
do you realize in this last church that we're living in today that we are the first church in church history that believes in Jesus but also believes that we revolve some, from something else. Right. Now right. that's that and 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 that that we didn't that we weren't created. Now even even some of our applications and some of our Bibles even talk about you know possible evolution. Some of those things or not necessarily evolution, but they'll, they'll talk about prehistoric or they'll talk about millions of years, right. and that was that's never been in the Bible exactly. ever. So so he's having to remind us in this church age, that he is the creator. And that you didn't evolve from something. Correct. You were created by a divine creator, exactly. and we are that first church in history to mix creation and Christianity, not creation, but Christianity, with the evolution. We just automatically think that, well, the, the books, the school books say, and the scientists say that we, we have evolved, so we must have evolved from something. But it is a lie. It is and a lie. We have, uh, we have much uh, teaching on that subject in itself. So yes, we'll, we we'll try to get to that at some point as well. Yes. So he reminds himself, let's go back to, 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 to Ephesus in chapter 2. He reminds himself that I'm with you because what the path that you're about to walk, you're going to make, have to need me in, in, a, in, a, in a very deep and personal way. So as we break this down, this is, this is what he says. This, this is our Ephesians. This is their uh, commendation. This is what they're doing right. He says, this is what you're doing right in verses 2 and 3. I know all the things you do. I have seen your hard work and your patient endurance. I know you don't tolerate evil people. You have ex examined the claims of those who say that you are apostles but are not. You have discovered that they are liars. You have patiently suffered with me without quitting. Okay. So this is what you're getting right, church, Ephesus Church. This is what you're getting right. They made, un underline, serving God, uh, serving God a priority. So this is what they did. They made serving God a priority. That's a good thing. This is what you're doing right. They had persevered. They had been, remained steadfast. That, that's a good thing. The, underline this and write this in. They, they, uh, their theology was impeccable. Their theology was impeccable. In other words, you have protected, you have served, you have persevered, you have remained steadfast. Your theology is impeccable. You do not let anything rock your theology or, or water down your theology. It is impeccable. But and, uh, what he says is you have put to the test the false teachers and you've exposed those false teachers. You have kicked them out. You have done such a wonderful job. Right. Now here's your criticism. Yeah, way to go, Ephesus, but... <laughs> yeah, this would be great if we could end right there. I mean, please speak of Christ Point Church in this fashion, but don't put the next two. Right. But here's your criticism. Notice in verse 4, here's your criticism. Here's what you're doing wrong. But I have this complaint against you. You do not love me or each other as you did at first. So you have lost or, or, or you have uh, uh, forgotten or you have... Uh, ignored your first love. So you have left or lost your first love. That's that agape love. And I want you to notice something with me. This is what the church at Ephesus had done. They had motion, but no emotion. They had action, but no passion. They, they were so busy doing the right thing that they had lost focus on the love thing. And they were so in love with their theology that they had forgot how to love Jesus. Right. So in other words, you're doing church really well, mm -hmm. but you've forgotten how to love me. Right. Coming back to us, now you can see how the church of the modern age are doing just that. In a lot of arenas, they're doing those things. You know, we're so, uh, we're so focused on the busyness of the church, uh, the events, on the culture, on the, all these things that we're forgetting who we're supposed to be serving, who is above it all, and that's Jesus Christ. And, and so we need to remind ourselves of that. See, it doesn't matter in today's age. You know, you, you hear, you know, lights and smoke, and, and it doesn't matter. There, there's nothing wrong with lights and smoke. No. There's nothing wrong, uh, there's nothing wrong with, with uh, 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 lights up and, and hymnals. There's nothing wrong with, with steeples. There's nothing wrong with tradition. There's nothing wrong with, with uh, 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 contemporary. 
That's what right. is wrong is when any of these churches begin to put more into that than we do into exactly. into, into, into these are all Jesus. good things, all but good they things. can be and they can go before the Lord if we don't watch them. Okay, so here's a question that that needs to be asked, and the question is, am I in love with Jesus? Absolutely. We need to constantly ask ourselves that. Step back. Am I still in love with Jesus? As I was when I first began. Because, man, when we start out with that relationship with the Lord, we are on fire. We love Him. We can't do enough for Him. But as time wanes, as time or as time progresses, our devotion and our focus on Him can wane real, real easy. Am I still as on fire as I was and still in love with him as I once was. And everything drifts towards status quo. Mm -hmm. Everything will. In other words, um, you have to rediscover your passion for the Lord. Your mercies are renewed every morning. I read something this morning, or I, I heard something this morning, and it said, in, in, a, in essence, it said, you become the things that you pay attention to. You become the things that you are involved in. So, you know, are we still as involved with Christ as we once were? Exactly. Now, we looked at the we looked at the, the commendation, what's right, the criticism, what's wrong. Let's look at the exhortation, how how Ephesus can fix what's wrong. So look at verse five. We're gonna break that down. Look how far you have fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. If you don't repent, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. So, underline and fill that in. Jesus paraphrased, if you don't change this, I will close your church. Now, let me just make sure that we don't confuse this. with the, Jesus is not speaking to the individual. He's speaking to the church. He's not speaking to, the, particularly right here, to the individual. He's not saying, look, if you don't, ser you know, if you don't serve me, I'm going to you know, take away your, your, your heaven privileges. He is saying, I'm, I'm talking to the church. If you don't get this straightened out, if you don't correct what's wrong, it doesn't matter how many good things you're doing right. All that matters is what is what needs to be corrected. If you don't get that fixed, then I'm going to close your church. Yeah, I want you to notice something with me. None of us has ever met anyone that has ever attended the church at Ephesus. Because it is no more. Because it, they didn't adhere. They right. didn't listen. They didn't pay attention. And Jesus closed their church. So Jesus goes on and he says something else in verse 6. We're, we're landing this plane. And I want you to notice what Jesus says in verse 6. But this is in your favor. You hate the evil deeds of the Nicolaitans just as I do. So, this is, this, this is what God, Jesus, Jesus, the Lord does not say that he hates a lot of things. But he hates this. I'm going to show you what he hates. What is it that he hates? He hates the practice of the Nicolaitans. And what is the practice of the Nicolaitans? So, remember, God underlined, God hates the deeds of the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans. Nicolaitans is a compound word that real, that literally means nikos, which means uh, to conquest, to triumph, to, for a victory, to rule. Uh, laos means the people or laity. That's where we get the church congregation, the laity. So the Nicol Nicolaitans literally means to rule over the laity. Jesus said, I hate that. I hate that. He says, listen, I despise that. And here's why I despise it. We are not gods. We are not lords. We are surrounded in this world today by cults. Mm -hmm. Cults are everywhere. Right. And cults lord over people. They tell them what they can do, where they can go, who they can marry, who, uh, what they can eat, when they can come, when they can go, if they can even see their families. And, and all of that is, is, is the lording over. It's the, it's the practice of Nicolaitans. And uh, the, the church... God, God's church, the true Christian church, is one that says, hey, let us share the word of God. The Holy Spirit is the one that does the convicting. And we're not the ones that say, you better, you better not. We are the ones that just bring the message, and the Holy Spirit is the one who does the convicting. Right. So at Christ Point Church, we're going to tell you what's right and wrong. Right. Let me, let me reiterate. There it says, in your fill-in, remember, God hates the deeds of the Nicolaitans. And then that next fill-in is to rule over the laity or the people. Yeah, so so at Christ Point Church, uh, we're gonna we're gonna teach what's right and wrong. Absolutely. If you you know we're gonna tell you what's right and wrong, uh, we're not gonna make you do anything. We're we're going to come along beside you, and uh, Paul even writes about that in Second Corinthians in the block there. I want you to read it with us. Not that we lord it over your faith, but are workers with you for your joy, for in your faith you are standing firm. So. 
Paul is saying, it's not our position to lord over you. We're not, we're, we're, we're not, we're not that, uh, God has not given us that authority. Right. Uh, he has given, uh, basically there is an authority in, 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 in God's calling, but not that kind of authority. And Paul says, just like a Christ Point church, we're not going to lord over you. We're going to come along beside you. Amen. And you notice what he says, but we are workers with you. So we, we do this together as teams. Absolutely. We're going to come along beside you. We're going to accomplish this together with you, and we're going to build one another's faith together. Amen. So ultimately, the church didn't get it. Just it didn't get it. Uh, we would like to have seen them get it. The church didn't get it, so Jesus appeals to the individual. That's verse 7 says, Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious, I will give the fruit from the tree of life in the paradise of God. So he's playing with the individual at this point because the church was not paying attention. Okay, so that's week two. That's the church of Ephesus. Now we're going to kick it back out to you guys, and we're going to we're going to discuss this. So, hey, thank you for going along on this journey with us. Thank you for this study uh, coming along beside us. And uh, 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 we'll... Uh, We'll kick it over to you guys, and, and we'll let you guys pray us out after, after you've had your discussion. We're real people living real lives, serving a real God. Welcome, Welcome home. home.